What up, bros? What up, bros? And welcome to an extra credit episode of Raw Meets World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, uh, Siege. Oh, you were Siege. Nice. I am Tony Curtis. <laughs> um, and this week we are talking about the 2022 movie The Batman. Um, and we cannot talk about The Batman without our very special guest, Chris Lord. Hello. Hi. Chris Chris is uh, no stranger to the podcast. We've had you on before. Yeah. This is simply to talk about other superhero movies. <laughs> it's um, almost like I have a wheelhouse. Exactly. But yeah. Chris, why don't you give us your history with the Batman franchise? You know, if you have any history. If, if I had any at all. Um, yes, uh, I am a lifelong Batman fan uh, to the point where a few years ago, uh, I met a friend named Cameron who's also been on the uh, podcast before. And uh, we decided we both loved like the DC animated universe. It started with Batman animated series and what did two white guys in LA do? They Start make a podcast, podcast about it. <laughs> uh, we, it was called Tim Talk. We just recently wrapped. We covered everything in that universe, including Batman Beyond, Justice League, uh, all of that. But as a result of doing that show, I have become people's like go-to Batman guy, which is not a bad thing at all. So... You are yeah, course, technically is- an expert. That's what I'm realizing. Like <laughs> me and Siege, whether we want to admit it or not, are Boy Meets World experts. Yeah, it's I actually just, know way more it. about Boy Meets World than I would like to admit at this point in time. Like if you had asked <laughs> me to fair. Yeah. the podcast, I would have felt differently. But now <laughs> I you know, I don't I don't like saying I'm a Batman expert because there's so much I don't know. And in fact, uh, we were constantly like having to put shout outs to some other friends we made during the podcast who play in the same sort of space. Like, hey, are we right about this? We're almost always wrong. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I consider myself decently knowledgeable about Batman. It, it, it is my, uh, let's call it my number two fandom. So. If there's one thing modern news has taught me is that the term expert is very loose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's you make up the definition of expert. And honestly, if it comes to Batman, if I had a question, I would call you. So well, I appreciate I, that. Yeah. Thank you. I will, I'll do my best to live up to my semi-earned reputation. See, what's uh, your history with Batman for those okay. who are listening for the first time? <laughs> All right, so I've always loved superhero movies, and I've always been a big DC person. I think that's kind of changed recently just because the Marvel Cinematic Universe has just gotten so, like, good. It's um, better. You can say it. It's just better. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's much better. Um, yeah. But growing up, I was definitely a huge DC fan to the point where um, I had, like, I, I debated whether or not I wanted to get a tattoo of Batman's logo on my back when I was 16, 17. It was going to be the entire length of my back. And my mom was. was like, she was trying to find a clever way to convince me not to do it. So she's like, what, what, why don't we work on getting you a car instead? And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And that that's the reason why I don't have a tattoo of Batman on my back right now. But you did have the Batmobile. I totally but forgot I about that. Did, yes, I did my first car. It, it, I don't know how this happened, but I went away for the summer. And when I came back, mom had decked out my bla- uh, my 1998 Mitsubishi Galant, spray painted it black, put a giant Batman symbol on the hood, and everything inside interior was Batman. The steering wheel, everything. What? Yeah. And yeah, you, you know what? When I was 16, I thought it was the coolest shit in the world. But to, I still think it's the coolest thing. It's, it's car, so cool. But to have a car where everyone knows exactly where you are and who you are, eventually I, got, I, I prefer the anonymity of not having a Batman symbol on my car. Um, but yeah, I grew up watching the, the Burton movies. I grew up watching the uh, Schumacher movies. Um, the animated series is one of my favorite animated shows of all time Mm -hmm. um so yeah just uh, i love batman as a character and i'm really excited to have this conversation today siege yeah um so a few things one i wanted to go off really quick i do remember the batman (laughs) car that you had but it's so funny because you're right what i remember most is being able to spot you at any point in time in kissimmee traffic (laughs) (laughs) you were your own little bat signal so it was actually really funny um i for those of you who don't know i currently have a tattoo of the 1989 
uh, Batman. Uh, that was a movie that my father and I bonded over. It's a movie I've seen so many times. I still think Michael Keaton is fantastic in that movie. And uh, ever since then, I have been a huge fan of the Batman franchise, specifically when we're talking movies, the animated series. Um, I'm very down to get um, have conversations about the mythology. Um, I will say that mine is mostly uh, visual media. I haven't really gotten in, sorry. I haven't really gotten into the games or the comic books. So uh, I'm not an expert there, but overall a huge Batman fan. And uh, over the past few years, I have to say, I've definitely been looking at DC characters in general very differently. So I look forward to uh, having this conversation because I have thoughts. I mean, you guys started the call saying like, I'm the Batman guy. Like we, we've established that you're both also Batman guys. Like I've never had a car that's Batman themed, never had a Batman <laughs> tattoo. So if anything, like I'm paling in comparison <laughs> to your love of Batman. You hear that? We are now Batman experts. <laughs> <We're> Batman experts. <laughs> I would say that your Lego collection would say differently. Like, okay, that is fair. I do. <laughs> I might have on my desk right here uh, the 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 Batmobile from the Batman, a Lego minifigure from the Batman. <laughs> I also Chris, do you say... get into the printed material? Like, do you read the comics and the, the graphic novels at all? Yeah, I mean, I've read I've read a decent amount. I mean, the thing with Batman is the character has been around since 1939, right? So, like, I have not read the bulk of it, but I mean, I have sure. read uh, in particular Year One, Long Halloween, Dark Victory. Hush. Uh, I've read all of those more times than I can possibly count. Um, as a kid growing up, I read the uh, like Cataclysm and No Man's Land run, which is really fantastic. I revisited this last year. Um, I even recently embarked on reading the entire Grant Morrison run from the early 2000s, uh, which is really fantastic. If very hard to figure out what to read in what order because comics are convoluted. And I once had a, a list and I somehow deleted it, which was dumb because <laughs> it took me three days to build that list. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I've read like um, like uh, Ego and Other Tales, which Matt Reeves has said was a big inspiration for him for this movie, uh, Earth One, which has a lot of other reference points. So and just generally speaking, like I know a decent amount about the comics lore on top of, as CJ put it, the visual medium, so. Great, great, great. Okay, uh, should we do the, tell me about it? Yeah, I didn't prepare a song. I mean, I, I didn't Boy Meets World this just because it <laughs> felt like a three hour movie summed up into a few lyrics would be too much. Um, but <laughs> if you could just give us a quick uh, just recap of it, that'll, that'll be a great jump start. Absolutely. This is will be like as high level of a recap as possible. Basically, I am reading the description from Wikipedia. But either way, right. uh, The Batman 2022. Batman ventures into Gotham City's underworld when a sadistic killer leaves behind a trail of cryptic clues. As the evidence begins to lead closer to home and the scale of the perpetrator's plans becomes clear, he must forge new relationships, unmask the culprit, culprit and bring justice to the abuse of power and corruption that has long plagued the metropolis. That sounds right. Yeah, right? I mean, that, yeah. that really is the summary of the movie. Um, there's just so much more to get into. Uh, but T, why don't you give us the rundown really quickly? Because I know you have that IMDb up. Um, and, and Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the cast, right? So yeah. uh, the Batman is going to be starring Robert Pattinson as Bruce Wayne. We have Zoe Kravitz as Selena Kyle, Jeffrey Wright as Lieutenant James Gordon. Colin Farrell as Penguin. Unrecognizable. Yeah, unrecognizable. It just should have cast Richard Kynes, but continue. Um, <laughs> Paul Dano as the Riddler. Uh, John Turturro as Carmine Falcone. Um, Falcone, am I saying that right? Um, Andy Serkis as Alfred. Um, and Peter Saz Sarsgaard as District Attorney Gil Coulson. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's the main cast. Mm -hmm. So I would say, let's get into what you really came here for, which are these hot takes. I want to know everyone's feelings on it, because I'm, I'm going to let you know right now, I have some controversial takes. But I, of course, I want to hear Surprising. everyone else's. So Lordy, as our guest, we will allow you to go first. And right. I do just want to quickly, I'm so sorry, uh, just say for the listener, 
we're going to be talking spoilers like Absolutely. crazy. So <laughs> go watch the movie first before you listen to this. Or if you don't plan on watching the movie, we're going to cover most of it, I'm sure. But okay, yeah, Lordy, just overall, you know, yeah. thoughts. Yeah, so I I loved this movie, which I think is maybe part of the reason CJ wanted to have me on here. Um, I mean, do you want me to get into full reasons as to why I love it? Absolutely. Go, okay. go, give us your take. So going in, I was very skeptical. Uh, I was getting really tired of every Batman director having to like out dark and grit the previous one because that had just been the general trend starting with Burton and then, well, less so Schumacher, but certainly Nolan through Snyder and now up to Matt Reeves. Um, and it just looked... Going in, I was like, it looks so emo. I don't really need a super grounded take on Batman. Again, um, I, it just didn't feel like it was going to do anything particularly new or different than what, what Nolan covered. Um, but then when I actually sat down to watch it, I was completely brought in by the first like 10 minutes, like the opening sequence um, of uh, the Riddler's first kill, but then especially the, the narration that we learned is that you know, his journals that he does every single night as the Batman. Um, kind of over the city as we're focusing in on different crimes and then eventually it just settles in on you know him going to take out this group of like you know gang members who are harassing some guy in a subway like that was what I have been wanting from a Batman movie for a really long time which is let's just jump straight in let's make this city like horrible and just dark and gritty and grungy and disgusting and have voiceover too like i mean one of the best things about a lot of the comics referenced earlier most written by jeff loeb is that they have that sort of like narration like it feels like a detective noir story so i was just completely brought in right from the beginning um and it mostly kept me there pretty much all the way through i will say at three hours it is too long yeah yeah it's a hundred really it's a hundred percent too long it feels like it's building towards a sense of resolution when they finally go into the club to get Falcone out and then it goes on for almost another hour. And at that point, I like, I'm like, I said, I felt the runtime, but like, it felt like the story was going beyond what was a natural closure point for it. Um, but a lot of my reservations, I still hold on to. Like, I, I don't necessarily love another really like grounded take on on Batman. I think the squirrel suit was the one moment that I just like couldn't, I just couldn't be bothered with. I thought it was really stupid. Um, but I was willing to kind of forgive all of the other issues I had with it because this movie did the one thing that basically no Batman movie really has ever done, but certainly no one in any recent history has done, which is to end it on a note where Batman is like hopeful good guy Batman, like very much the Batman we see in the animated series who like is my Batman, Kevin Conroy is a legend. Like that is for me and for I think a lot of people our age, the definitive take on, on Batman. And I was really surprised to watch that this movie was the closest I've seen to a take close to Batman in the mid series, despite everything else about it being very almost like opposite of that. Um, but the fact that they gave us a Batman who actually wants to be a symbol of hope for the city was enough for me to go, okay, the rest of it I can deal with because this was the one thing that I've been waiting my entire life to see in a Batman movie. Uh, um, I love that take, but I also, you kind of like just skipped over something really, really important, which is the squirrel suit. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the movie yet, um, there is a part in the movie where Batman needs to escape the cops, uh, which you need to do when you're a vigilante. And mm -hmm. he literally just like pulls out the flying squirrel suit inflatable and a i will say it was a great piece of realism to me to be like okay you've actually explained to me how someone like this would escape that without using a grappling hook which seems to go to nowhere so i mm -hmm. really really appreciated that um but then he just like eats it at the end and absolutely no broken bones and again there's just like this point it's like are we in realism or are we not like like <laughs> well and, and that is like the one thing that i find really bizarre about this movie right is it's hard not to draw comparisons to nolan right because nolan was the first one who's like hey how can i find a way to make this make sense in the real world and for me in particular batman begins is the only real standout batman movie of that trilogy like i think the the dark knight Ooh, is kind of a great thing. modern crime thriller, but it's actually a terrible Batman movie. Um, especially because like the choice at the end of The Dark Knight where he chooses to be the villain is literally the opposite of what Batman do. Like Batman would do what he does in this one, which becomes a symbol of hope. And that that rubbed me the wrong way right when I watched it. It still bothers me, even though it thematically makes sense. But like 
that world goes out of its way to seemingly be really, really grounded, but also like it has this sort of like high tech, almost kind of like James Bond esque, like five minutes in the future technology. Whereas here, Reeves is like, hey, let's make the technology like pretty much as grounded as possible. But that Gotham, that world is not believable at all as a real world. Like it is, it is nonstop raining. It's dirty. It's it's just it's bizarre. I mean, a lot of it was filmed out in like Scotland, so it has like this kind of old, very gothic style to it. That in my mind, like the whole place feels so weird. It's not grounded, but at the same time, it's trying it very hard to be grounded. So it's a weird juxtaposition they tried to go for, which ultimately worked for me. But I hope they lean more into the weirdness next time around and not the like, hey, let's be really grounded and serious again. Yeah, you're right. It's like 1980s New York, but during monsoon season. Season, exactly. Like, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's probably the best interpretation I've seen of Gotham in a long time. I mean, I, I actually, if there's, I hate Joker. I'm just kidding, right here. I hate the movie The Joker. The one thing I liked about that movie was its interpretation of Gotham, and I'm really glad now that this did it better, so I can stop complimenting that film because I don't like to do so. I love uh, that basically you and I have the exact same position on any Batman movie <laughs> over the last 10 years. But, uh, you know, like, like we can come back to that. T, what was your first uh, first reaction to the movie? You, okay, it just kind of overall, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I'm not so much you excited to rewatch it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I, I was with the movie, honestly, for the first, like, first and most of the second act. Like, when we are solving these Riddler crimes, I felt like there was a pace uh, with the riddles and everything, and I was kind of with it up until the Riddler got caught. And then, to me, the movie's uh, pacing kind of deflated a little bit mm -hmm. for me. Um, I have issues with the third act that we can get into. Um, I wasn't completely sold on him as Bruce Wayne Batman, uh, Robert Pattinson. Um, I also at no point in the movie wanted to see him fuck Selena Kyle, which I know <laughs> I was supposed to. I was supposed to feel like there was that like sexual chemistry, but I wasn't. I wasn't feeling that uh, between the two of them at all. Um, to your point, I like the tech. I love the Batmobile. Maybe one of my favorite yes. Batmobiles. It's so um, good. And I just love that it's a detective movie at heart, which is one of the things I don't feel like I've ever truly seen in a Batman movie. I mean, when you compare Batman Forever's Riddler and like <laughs> the stakes of what that was and the, the riddles that were coming out, like it, it just, this just feels so much more, um, you know, the, I was telling my wife, I felt like I saw Seven, like mm -hmm. um, yeah. with Morgan Freeman and, and Brad Pitt, uh, but instead with Commissioner Gordon and, and Bruce Wayne. And I love their, their partnership. I actually thought he had a better relationship with Commissioner Gordon than he did anyone else in the film, Alfred included. And I don't know how I feel about that. Um, mm -hmm. But overall, I liked it. But yeah, I, 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 I don't know how I feel about the third act and the conclusion and the final, um, I, I guess, mass shooting scene. Like the, that whole thing. I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. But um, Siege, what, what about you? What were your first impressions? Okay, so I'm very happy that I went last because I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to be direct. I did not like this movie. I felt like this movie <laughs> was, I feel like this movie is something that we get a lot of lately, which is, I love the ingredients of this movie. I think they do so many things right. I think the Batmobile um, used as a symbol of fear is absolutely done perfectly. I think um, the kind of slickness and uh, tete -a tete that Batman and Selena Kyle have is really done really well. Zoe Kravitz, oh my God, can I live just in her mirror? <laughs> but like, yes. she is amazing. Colin Farrell, unrecognizable. Um, using the Joker and, sorry, not the Joker, the Riddler and having him do like a Zodiac approach. Again, a great interpretation. I love the ingredients of this movie. It felt like an empty meal. Like to me, this, I, I'm very plot driven. And there's just so many things in this movie where you're like, wait, what? Like, what, what, what do you mean? Where were we going with this? And why did you draw it out for so long? For example, one of the things that I really critiqued, you talked about Batman and uh, Alfred. And the moment, like, like the Batman choice, sorry, the choice to have Bruce Wayne be kind of like an emo, uh, secluded mystery. I understand, not what I'm used to, but I get it. But the moment 
he said, you're not my dad. I was like, and I'm out. <laughs> like, 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 I can't deal with a, what is supposedly like, what, 30 year old man telling his caretaker of the last 30, 20 years, you're not my dad. Like, where are we right now? If, if this was Batman Beyond, I would take it. Um, if this was the origins of Bruce Wayne, I would take it. But at this point in time, that relationship should be a little bit more solidified. And there were just so many things where I, I was like, e like this movie didn't know if it was, if we were in the beginning or if we were in a experienced Batman. And there's a way to do second year Batman where it's like, he's a little behind and he's not quite there. That would have been a little bit better, but this movie just kept going back and forth between, hey, he's new, he's a novice, and actually he's really experienced and he knows what he's doing. Uh, and that's, again, one of my biggest complaints. The detective aspect of it. I love a good detective story. I love a good noir. However, there are so many clues where it's like, how did Batman, the detective, not get there? Like, there, some, someone pointed out um, something which I thought was really amazing. And they talked about the fact that, um, again, spoiler for the movie, um, one of the final clues that we get is Riddler's blunt object is a carpeting tool. And it's only with the help of a civil servant that Batman is able to get that final clue. I thought that that is a great way. If all of our clues were something that Batman, the Batman, would not have been able to decipher because of his privilege in class, and it was kind of this commentary on how you can be the greatest detective in book smarts, but unless you have street smarts, you're going to be a little behind, this movie would have been amazing. Give me more of that. But it was just, again, back and forth in its level of how qualified and how good of a detective this detective story was. And uh, yeah, that's that's just my initial first reactions. Uh, so with, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to, you know, uh, try to structure this a little bit. Um, you know, <laughs> we have, there's, there's so much to this movie. Um, can we just get, I guess, everyone's thoughts on casting? Yeah, let's go cast. Mm -hmm. Chris, what, what were your thoughts on, on the Batman <clears throat> cast? I, I think it pretty much works for me. I think the cast across the board is really good. I, I was one of those people that when they cast Robert Pattinson, I'm like, oh yeah, that should, that makes sense. I've never seen a Twilight movie in my entire life. Um, <laughs> cause, cause why? Okay. Um, but since Twilight, he's done just like really weird, dark indie stuff. Um, and I, I, I wasn't super excited about having yet another young level, like at the beginning of his career, Batman. This, this is one of the things I was really disappointed with how awful the Snyderverse came out was I was actually very excited for like a Batman in his 40s who had a history, who had like the Bat family. Um, and I actually think Ben Affleck's pretty decent in otherwise really terribly written and directed films. But so I wasn't super keen on like another young Batman. But if you're going to do it, I think Robert Pattinson was a good choice. And I think everyone else to me just made perfect fucking sense. Like Zoe Kravitz should have been Catwoman forever, basically. <laughs> um, like there are a couple, like in particular, like shots and outfits that she wears in this that are pulled directly from the year one comic. Like literally like they use year one as like a, a, a test bed for like, we're gonna just pull this directly. I think she's absolutely incredible. Uh, fun fact, I've forgotten that she actually voiced Catwoman in the Lego Batman movie. So this was her oh, second stab at oh. Catwoman, which is awesome. A very different take on it. I think Paul Dano was like the perfect choice for Riddler. Like, yeah, yeah. obviously he's a Riddler. He's just like this weird nerdy guy who has this dark underside to him. I, I do agree on the Colin Farrell thing. I, I love Colin Farrell. He's brilliant in the movie. Bizarre choice to make him completely made up to be like unrecognizable and also have very little like penguin-ness about him as it were. Um, and then even Andy Serkis, I was a little bit surprised at Alfred until I watched it and I realized that this is definitely the um, Batman Earth One, Alfred, um, which in that story, and again, it, it sort of helps and hurts that I have all this comic like background to bring into it. But like, I was gonna say, you were like, oh, I'm not an expert, and then you just start riffing off all of these. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But like in that one, he isn't Bruce's butler. He's an old friend of Thomas Wayne's who is brought in to handle Thomas's security while he's running for mayor. A plot thread they literally pulled into this film, um, and after. Thomas and Martha Wayne are killed, he takes custody of Bruce and basically just says like offhand, like uh, I'm your butler because Bruce has no idea who the hell this guy is. But really he trained him how to fight 
He trained him how to protect himself, even use the cane. It's very much that version. So recognizing that's what they were doing, I can understand why they cast Andy Serkis, who I think is brilliant, but very underutilized. Um, yeah, another, I mean, also, and then I can't even, Jeffrey Wright, it was like born to play Gordon. Jeffrey Wright is one yeah. of my all-time favorite actors. He's amazing in everything. He's, I think, probably the best on-screen Jim Gordon. And I loved, I loved Gary Oldman in the, the Nolan movies, but Jeffrey Wright can do no wrong. And once again, he does it here again. He's just incredible. So overall, I think the casting was fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I, I really do agree that um, for me, at least outside of Robert Pattinson, I really do feel like Zoe Kravitz, Paul Dano, Jeffrey Wright, like couldn't have asked for better cast for those roles. Mm -hmm. um, not really sure what the purpose of was making Colin Farrell Penguin if they weren't going to make him look like Colin Farrell. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess I went back and watched Batman Returns recently and I just, I really love the makeup in that. And I just thought there could have been some yes. fun stuff with it, but you know, it, it's a different universe, whatever. Um, I also really love, um, you know, John Turturro. Am I saying his name right? I, yes. I love him in mm -hmm. everything. And he just, um, I thought he was just a great, like old school mob boss. I, you know, one of the things I kind of liked about this movie was the way they portrayed Gotham and crime and organized crime and uh, like, making Batman's foes more human than just people who clearly need therapy. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I just thought that, that he did a great job with that as well. And, um, you know, I, I, as far as Alfred goes, I, I don't really have a strong feeling either way. Um, but um, yeah, that was pretty much my overall take. Siege? I've said this before, I love the ingredients. I think that everyone is cast perfectly. I think like, even like you said, if you're gonna hide Colin Farrell, like why? I like, I love what you said of like Richard Kind. I think that would have yeah. been a very interesting <laughs> take, but then also I think if once you cast him, this immediately becomes a little bit more of a comedy than what yeah. they were going for. But I think, and um, for those of you who haven't Listen yet, uh, Lordy is producer on this show um, called X Ray, and they had a guest who's in charge of the movies. Um, or he's kind of like, what would you say? It, so it's yeah, it's Michael Uslan who he secured the rights to produce Batman in the seventies. Took him ten years to get the eighty nine film made. He was determined to make like an actual dark gritty Batman because for him the the sixties TV show was way too campy. Um, and so he, he was like a big creative shepherd in that first movie. And then he's been the executive producer on every one since then. And I, it's hard to tell exactly how much creative input he's had, but you know, he, we'll call him a, a shepherd of the franchise from the beginning, at least. I'll just say that the reason why I say it is while listening to his interview, he noted that he like, he, as you said, he didn't like like the campiness of 1960s Batman. And uh, I, I felt like this movie could have used a little bit more camp. I mean, like we're dealing with billionaires and penguins <laughs> and, <laughs> and rat, like you know, like cat people just up like cats and bats. Like it's like it's fine to lean in a little bit, and I feel like Richard Kind would have let us lean in a little bit more to this like hyper realistic world. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I think the casting is great. I think everyone does a really good job in their roles. I just think that the roles and the storylines are a little um, a little unbaked. I feel like the roles and the storylines don't commit all the way. And that is what really bothers me. I also am, I have seen the Twilight movies, uh, not by my own okay. choosing, but I have seen them. <laughs> and like, I mean, Siege, I don't know if you can comment on this at all. There was a kind of Edward Cullen Twilight-ness to Robert Pattinson's performance. In that movie, he's very awkward. And when he's in social settings and he's like always staring at people and not really talking and, and kind of having these one word answers. And he kind of does that again in this movie. And, you know, I think, I think uh, one of the things I always loved about the Batman the animated series is that um, I always got the feeling that, or that we were supposed to believe that Batman was who Bruce really was. And Bruce Wayne was kind of the mask that he wore. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe we're supposed to believe that this is at the point in Batman's evolution where he hasn't perfected the mask of Bruce Wayne, but this kid was awkward. And every time he was in a public setting, he seemed so, so emo, the way he had his like Tobey Maguire, uh, Spider-Man 3 haircut. Like I just, there was things about it that I had a hard time accepting, even though I'm sure it played well to people who probably aren't as familiar with his Twilight work. I would just want to say, like right now, if you were if, if you were just a Gothamite and you are in the city and there is suddenly a vigilante with all of this equipment just kind of going from place to place, 
who would you pick? Would it be the booty <laughs> billionaire who's also a secret and you barely know anything about? Like that that's one of the reasons why I had a problem with like this interpretation of Bruce Wayne is because as you said, it's just not much of a departure from Batman. And I feel like if you are someone who is like trying to solve the riddle of who is Batman, it's not a large leap to go, oh, the moody guy who lives in a mansion down the street who we very rarely ever see. Um, And I like, if we're gonna talk about this being early on, and as you said, kind of like, he hasn't perfected that mask, but like, like showing the evolution. I would have loved like, one or two scenes of Bruce like putting on a fake smile, you know, like taking like a really deep breath right before he goes into um, whatever event and just being like, <sighs> you know, like like this idea of like, just like maybe doing it too much or maybe like, you know, just smiling and not talking enough. And people were like, is that kid autistic? You know, like something like that. Like that's what I would like to see when I don't, well, what I didn't really enjoy was emo with the bangs. Bruce no. Wayne. No, like, like that's where I was like, you lost me. I, I will fully agree. The hair is awful. It does drive me nuts. <laughs> the hair is really, really terrible. And like, I don't, I don't love that this is yet another proto Batman movie. Like, that's how Batman Begins feels. Where it's like, it, there. I, I think there's an argument made that either, you know, it's like this or Batman Begins, like the best interpretation of a Batman in live action. However, they're both like not fully Batman. And the one thing I will say is, I agree that I didn't love that Bruce Wayne was so minimalized. I felt though the movie for me at least gave me enough justification as to why, like this is a version who has so abandoned any possibility of trying to do something beyond just being Batman. Like, you know, the, the mayoral candidate basically comes up and was like, um, you're a billionaire, you could be doing a lot. Your family has a history of philanthropy and you are literally doing nothing. And I do feel like the arc of Batman in this is very well defined and probably the best arc of any Batman we've had in any movie. The problem is, is that it basically just ignores Bruce Wayne. And I, it, to me, it makes sense, but I do understand the idea of like, it could have had maybe like one more beat there at the end to show that now we're going to see this reflected in Bruce as well. I think this is a movie that kind of like Batman Begins where the sequel I'm either going to love or hate because Definitely. if, if it does, if it doesn't, move on from the problems I have with this movie, I can forgive them once, but not a second time around. And so as long as in a next iteration, and, and it, it's kind of ridiculous to like review a movie based on its uh, almost guaranteed sequel. But if in the next iteration, he is attempting to put on that persona and to utilize Bruce as an asset to one, help the city, but two, also like cover his tracks, because CJ, a very good point. Like, who else would be doing this but this one guy clearly i think then i'll be a little more for forgiving of it and the the biggest thing is they gotta fix this fucking hair they gotta fix this hair like, <laughs> I, I love like what you said is like really funny because it is this idea of this movie is a great setup movie for the franchise that they have in mind but mm -hmm. again to me that means it's not a good movie on its own if you're like oh this will be great if the other two do its job, then it's like, okay, well then this one's not great. I, see, <laughs> I, I do see what you mean. I think for me still, I still think this movie is great. Just for, it, it, it gave me what I wanted. There were things that it didn't give me that I also wanted that I'm willing to let go because the big thing it gave me what I wanted. I, I will say this, like, again, going back to it, how I feel is like this movie doesn't commit. It brings up so many ideas that I'm like, oh yes, that's great. And then it's like, eh, we're going to talk about something else. And it's yeah. like, you could just commit. Go ahead, T. Oh, I was going to say to that point, one of the things that I was so disappointed in, and this is kind of a huge spoiler, is that this whole time you're, you're kind of led to believe that the Riddler knows Bruce Wayne is Batman. And to me, it just seems like it would have been so much more interesting if he did know who, was Bat who, Bat who Bruce was, if he was kind of manipulating and toying with him. And if maybe he just thought of it as this great riddle that he never wanted to reveal, but he loved that he was the only person who knew the answer to that question of who was Batman, like something like that. Um, because the whole idea of like Bruce's family and the way that they've spent their money and the way it's affected him, it just kind of felt like Bruce was being called out the way that he was, uh, I'm sorry, Paul Dana was attacking Batman, he was kind of like letting out this Bruce Wayne rage as well. And it just, to me, would have felt like a more complete movie 
Riddler's like, no, dude, I was hurt by Bruce Wayne, not Batman. Like all these other villains be- are hate on Batman, but my beef is with Bruce because of the way that his family has not contributed money to people the way they should, you know? Um, so that was kind of something that was a bummer for me. I absolutely agree. Like I like like that twist on the orphans. I thought was really like the orphans in the orphanage and being like we didn't get to be orphans because there was only one orphan that anyone ever cared about and we had to see his face on a regular basis. Like that is a great idea, but as you said, it doesn't really commit to it. Like like what to me would have been really interesting is like to have the other orphans who we've met, these adult orphans who are staying in the orphanage, have those be the Riddler's henchmen. Like having like some kind of connection to the the orphanage and Batman. And as you said, the calling out of Bruce specifically is like irrelevant of Batman. And then being like, oh shit, I, by the way, I know that you're the Batman, <laughs> but I don't care enough <laughs> because my whole, like kind of like what they've said previously was the Joker and then also there's like a line in this movie who are like we're in this together like I would have loved if they just kind of like again committed to that line of the Riddler being like oh no 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 I figured it out I mean it's not that hard but also um we're in this together either I actually believe that we're teammates or I'm using you to do my bidding because now Bruce Wayne is my bitch yeah 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 I I found the whole uh, Riddler knows Batman's identity thing, like really interesting red herring. Um, Because again, like having, having read the comics, like, I mean, it's, it's now almost 20 years old, but hush very famously in that story, uh, the Riddler deduces who Batman is. And then basically sets in motion, like this huge like chess game with all these different villains involved. And the the primary antagonist is other character named hush who they tease in this. Um, that character's name is Thomas Elliot. It was like Edward Elliot or something like that was the reporter that everyone suspects Thomas Wayne had murdered. So like right at the point where they're building towards that one plot thread, which did feel like if there was one thing they probably could have pulled out of this movie, it would have been that particular thread of like the history of the Waynes. Um, But as it was building towards that, they were sprinkling in these hush references. So like me as someone who's aware of that story, feels like that was placed as a deliberate red herring for me to assume that's where it's going to go. So then when it didn't go that way, I was pleasantly surprised. And then, you know, I guess it does thematically kind of make sense because at the end, the Riddler, you know, he thinks Batman is on his side and he's completely unaware of how that's not actually the case because he's unaware of the connection with, with Bruce and Batman. So ultimately, I, I actually liked they didn't go there. And for me, it made sense. But I also understand why it's a weird choice and if you're already doing for like a long movie to introduce this plot thread that seemingly goes nowhere feels a little bit extraneous when we're already pushing three hours yeah and and you know when uh the riddler is in uh i guess holding area and he starts saying bruce wayne in this really sinister way i felt the entire theater hold their breath they're like oh this fucker knows who he is and like for it to be a red herring for it to be this thing that's like I, I don't know. There's no suspense now. Like to rewatch the movie. That's what I kept thinking about is will this movie be fun to rewatch? And I don't know that the answer is yes for me. And a lot of that, again, has to do with the fact that the end of this movie is basically a mass shooting scene with incels that's kind of like a little hard. Like it's not hard to watch. It's just like it's not a fun watch. It's not something that I'm like excited to see again. Um, I will say I, the moment, the moment they had the snipers and I was like, tell me you're not about to shoot a black woman in front of my eyes after the fat past two years that I just had. And then they shoot her. And I was like, okay, I am immediately angry at you. Like if I, like if you could have shot anyone else, there is a whole cast of people in Gotham who you could have shot. And I would have been like, oh, that's unfortunate. But the one black woman (laughs) in power, you see her get shot. And I'm just like, did I need that? No, I didn't. And I'm actually a little upset that you even made me watch it. (laughs) Yeah, not the best choice in their part. So, but like, okay, so I just want to talk about some other things that I thought were like not the best choice. Specifically, we have like, you said um, earlier, we talked about the mayor. First of all, I feel like she's very underutilized. What is her platform? What does she say? Like, I don't know anything about her. And they introduce her as this beacon of hope. But I was like, I don't know what she's standing on. Like, if you're going to give me a politician, give me that politician's uh, platform and then let me decide or 
um, even kind of do like the Dark Knight thing where they actually set uh, Two-Face up as a candidate that the people actually could believe in. He was a beacon of hope. So I would have loved it to be this idea of Batman in this movie being like, actually, um, especially since she's the only one who calls him out in the movie, to be like, actually, Bruce is going to put his full weight behind her. We're going to make sure that this happens um, and that the city has reliable, consistent um, authority figures. But instead, it just kind of like, it says that every politician is corrupt. And then it also shows us saving every politician. There's a line where the Riddler says something about the uh, new mayor, I think her name's Rial, where he's just like, nothing's gonna change. She just got elected and there's not much you can do because the whole system's rigged. And I was like, oh, again, this is something really great to explore as someone who is very political and who understands the real world consequences of billionaires, corruptions, influence. This would have been a great opportunity to actually give us either a solution or a pathway, but instead they were just like Batman's hope. And you're like, hope for what exactly? <laughs> like even Selena Kyle's like, oh, by the way, this city's like, it's, it's it's no good. I'm leaving. <laughs> and I was like, all right, she makes sense because she's looking at it. It's like, okay, yeah, you have a new mayor, but like not much has changed. So I'm leaving while the getting's good. And I was like, that's fantastic. But explain to me why Bruce or Batman, whichever one you want, is actually staying in the city. I understand that he thinks that he needs to be a symbol and a beacon of hope, but what is his platform? How does he intend on changing anything? And and, and one of the big, uh, you know, uh, criticisms that Batman gets, especially nowadays, is, you know, there's, a, there's way easier ways for a billionaire to clean up the streets of Gotham. You know, you don't need to go out there and actually fight people. You could build homeless shelters you could you know do these things with your money in a way that would positively affect the city and i thought that's where the movie was going and the, like to your point the fact that it never gets to that point was unsatisfying yeah lordy you said that um she calls him out and is like you're not doing anything he actually mm -hmm. is doing something he's destroying the little infrastructure gotham currently does have <laughs> and that, <laughs> that chase scene where he just like flips over um, a truck and he like, we see the fire and it's like very dominant in the trailer. First of all, I felt like that was a little lackluster because I was like, I've seen this in the trailer and it feels like a really hyped moment, but I also feel like I've already seen this. So I'm not getting everything that I need to get. But also I'm just like, there are other people on this road. You're not like in um, Penguin's territory and you're destroying all of his things these are gotham roads other people have to drive on this roads. does batman pay his taxes does like this is what i want to know is, is <laughs> one of the billionaires who just gets off um with the zero percent uh fi corporation tax like that's what i want to know because i think that the story of batman was great and, and all of DC was great early on because we didn't have billionaires. So you could say billionaire and someone would be like, oh, that's crazy. This person has more money than God. But we actually have billionaires. We've actually seen what billionaires do with their money. So if you're going to make it a little bit more real world and grounded, then give me real world situations and have them be more than just a line. Am I yeah. making sense? No, totally. I, I and yeah. I couldn't agree more. And and Chris, I know you have a, a hard out coming out soon. So yes. um, I, I just wanted you to, to get any last thoughts or opinions you had about the Batman out. Um, and then me and Siege can can carry on after you go. Yeah, I, I no look. I all these criticisms criticisms are totally valid. I was willing to let them go because overall I had a really good experience watching the movie. I have seen it twice, and I will say that I still really enjoyed it the second time around. I mm -hmm. like. There were specific things that I was really excited to get to. I, I do agree, like the the car chase has no real stakes, but that being said, like it's a really fun sequence. And it's, I, I also, I love Michael Giacchino's score in this. I, I love yeah. Michael Giacchino to begin yeah. with. He's my favorite film composer. I love his score. And I think that's one of the highlight sections, that little piece right there. Um, I, I do agree that there's like, it throws out a lot of ideas that it doesn't fully, fully answer. I feel like, I have no, nothing to back this up. Maybe one explanation for that is like, they just want to focus on like the fact that Bruce is painfully unaware of all these things going on around him. And he was just focused on this one singular thing. Doesn't forgive its flaws as a film, but maybe helps explain its choices. And I will say, CJ, next time I see you, I'm going to lend you this comic, um, Batman White Knight, which I don't know if you've heard of this. 
But the idea in that is basically that uh, the, the Joker takes a medicine that basically cures him of being the Joker and he goes back to being Jack Napier, the, the character's name in the 89 Batman movie. And he basically calls out all the things you just called out of like how Batman causes more destruction than he actually like saves things that if Batman were really a hero, he would give all of his assets and technology to the GCPD. Like it really leans in all this stuff, I think in a really interesting way that addresses some of those things that this film just didn't bother to address. I'm very curious to get your take on um, that comic in particular as like a, as a homework assignment that I'm giving you now as a part of this conversation. <laughs> Love it. Really quickly, give us um, a, like just like a, uh, a rapid fire list of all of your other topics that you wanted to, and then we'll just kind of pick it up from there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I love the version of the Batmobile in this. I was skeptical going in, but I thought it was really cool to have all the, his technology be, um, have a sense of it being hand built. There's a small thread that's like kind of brushed upon, but not fully executed where we see him like learning as he's going and evolving his technology a little bit as he goes, which I think is really cool. And feels like it's a response to the fact that Iron Man does that in literally every single Marvel movie that, um, that comes out. Uh, I thought the inclusion of Barry Keoghan as like kind of the Joker was an interesting choice. I'm kind of glad that, okay, look, I'll say this, <laughs> if, if they're going to do it, I'm glad they just did it this time. So we don't have to deal with like the three year fan casting that happened between Batman Begins and uh, the Dark Knight back in the 2000s, which was just absolutely insane. And like everyone in the grandma was being suggested as playing the Joker. So I'm kind of glad we can just not have to do that this time around. Um, yeah, I, I I love the campy stuff. CJ, you and I like like fell asleep drunk to watching this in the 60s Batman movie, which I rewatched the other day. I love the campy stuff. I love uh, Batman Forever in particular. I think it's super, super fun. I still have lots, like a lot of fun with Batman and Robin. Um, I'm more likely to watch all of those again, just because they're they're faster, they're more fun than this. This movie does kind of like lack humor and a little bit of self-awareness in some places and a little bit of sense of irony. Um, you know, but but that being said, it because it did the one thing that no one's willing to do, which is give us a Batman who wants to be a symbol of hope. Yes, I agree. Maybe he hasn't figured out how that's going to happen necessarily, but at least he aspires to it. I'm glad that it gave us that, which to me alleviated my concerns about this being just like the most brutal, morose world we've had yet, which otherwise it pretty much is. So. Thank you so much for hopping on, Chris. Can I ask you one last question before you go? What is your favorite Absolutely. Batman movie? It, okay. It's a slightly long answer. I'll do as short as I can. Uh, I think Batman Mask of the Phantasm is the best Batman movie ever made. It's the, the animated film that spun out of the animated series. Um, it just has like the most emotional core at its heart. It's a brilliant story. It looks gorgeous. It's great music. It has everything I want out of it. Um, from a live action perspective, I'd say probably Batman Begins, just in the sense that it found a way to deliver what I thought what the point was like the most comic accurate interpretation of Gotham. I think Christian Bale is best in that movie. Um, it, along with that, honestly, this is the Batman is super hot for me. Like I'd say, like the top three are the Batman, Batman Begins, and Batman Returns. Um, and it kind of depends on like my mood as to which one takes the um, the top spot there. I like the 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 last thing I'll say about this movie in particular is it was refreshing for me to see a Batman movie made by someone who wanted to make a Batman movie, which yeah. Christopher Nolan, I think, kind of did when it came to Batman Begins, but clearly had no interest in doing when it got to the Dark Knight, especially the Dark Knight Rises. Um, you know, even Tim Burton, for all that he brought to it, sometimes it feels like he was more concerned about making a Tim Burton movie than he was making a Batman movie. Um, whereas this, like, I could see the influence of the comics. I could see it, like, visually. I could see it in the storytelling and the characterizations. Um, you know, and so it makes me hopeful for what could possibly come down the line. And, you know, the less said about Zack Snyder, the better. He just wanted to make The Dark Knight Returns. So. <laughs> but, yeah, I... I, I I agree where the guys are coming from, but I, I have to say, I, I did love it. So. it you're, you have the freedom to be wrong. I think that's what's so great. Thank about you. Her. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> no one's ever told me that I'm allowed to be wrong. I have been much more comfortable making terrible choices throughout the rest of my life. Chris, we appreciate so you much. coming on. Thanks for yeah, having giving me. Giving us your I, expert opinion. 
yeah, no, it was uh, always fun to see you guys. Always fun to be back. And, uh, you know, I'll come back anytime to talk anything Batman. Thanks, guys. All right. All right, Siege. Uh, yeah. It is just the two of us now. Um, what I know you have some things that you did not get to talk to while we had uh, Chris on the phone. So tell me, tell me some hot takes, bro. Okay, okay. So it's kind of like continue the conversation. I think that this movie, like the detective part, I kind of hit on a little bit, but like they don't commit to him being a really good detective. As a matter of fact, there's this scene where he... <laughs> Um, we are with him in Selena Kyle's apartment for the very first time. And he just kind of looks at a piece of mail and he's like, Selena. And she's like, oh my God, you know my name. And I was like, really? Like, this is our detective right now. He looks at mail and that's how he gets information. Like, don't get me wrong. It's the way to get information, but it's just not a crime fighter superhero approach to getting information. There were lots of things in this movie where I was like, oh, so there's no mystery. Like, you're not gonna tease me even a little bit. You're just gonna give it directly and be like, isn't this cool? I think one of the things that Chris said, which really is starting to ring um, true to me is I think Batman Begins is a good Batman movie. I think that Batman 1989, a great Batman movie. I think that what we got here is someone, I, I sorry, let me rephrase that. I love pe different people's interpretation of Batman and what Batman stands for. So for example, for Tim Burton, he says that he saw Batman as an outsider. And it's a story about two outsiders, Batman and the Joker and how they approach life. One of them is I hide myself away and and do my actions. The other one is I want everyone to see me and I want everyone else to be an outsider. <laughs> you yeah. know, if everyone's an outsider, then no one is. Like that's their approach. And I think that that's a really interesting idea. I think that Christopher Nolan has a, had a really interesting idea about like what type of man would want to be a Batman. And yeah. I think that that's what Batman Begins gives us. I don't think this movie knows what they want their Batman to be other than they wanted to make a Batman movie. And they knew what they wanted their Riddler to be. They knew what they wanted their um, Catwoman to be. They knew what they wanted their rogue gallery to be. And then they just got someone who could do Batman pretty well. And they wanted Batman to be kind of amateur. Uh, you know, I, to your point, I, I enjoyed this movie's visuals quite a bit. I don't know how you yes. feel about them. But it almost felt like the movie, like I could watch it on mute, if that yes. makes sense. Like it's yes. so visually beautiful, but I think the on the other hand, the story is actually has some issues. And it's it's almost that thing where I think visually I was so intrigued by everything that was going on and just the way the cinematography was, the way they shot Batman. I loved him just being in the shadows, the silhouettes, uh, the lighting, the, the scene with him just fighting in that club in the red light, so badass. Um, but is when I'm the story that's happening in between these visuals isn't as compelling enough for me. And to Chris's point, he's like, I think I would rather watch fucking Batman Forever than this one. I agree. Batman Forever is definitely in my, and we're going to get to our, our favorite Batman movies, but the, you know, there is something to the fact of having a movie that's fun in the world you want to live in. And as visually beautiful as this movie was, it's not some world that I necessarily want to live in for another three hours. Ugh. Exactly. I think like you, you pointed it out perfectly. As I said, love the ingredients, didn't like the meal. I think so often people are like, as Chris, Chris kept saying, oh, it gave me what I wanted in an ending. And because of that, I liked it. And I was like, okay, you like bacon. You didn't like this meal. You just liked the bacon that was in this meal. And yeah. that's fine. You can be like, oh my God, I love it when they include bacon in a sandwich. That's great. But that doesn't mean that the sandwich was good. That just means that you like bacon. And I Well, you know, like I, I, I just want to quickly, I, I wanted to kind of reaffirm what Chris said, because I kind of felt the same way in, in, in that regard to that moment, which is in the Nolan films, it seems like Bruce can't wait to stop being Batman, which just isn't how I've ever seen Batman portrayed in any of the media that I consumed, especially the animated series. He was Batman. In this movie, it just felt like Robert Pattinson was Batman. He didn't give a shit about being Bruce Wayne. 
And he, throughout the movie, he kind of learned that vengeance can't be it. There needs to be a light to counterbalance the darkness. I get all of that. But the theme and the story aren't the same. I appreciate the theme. I don't know that I appreciated the story. Absolutely. This is what I'm saying, as you as you pointed out. I love the idea. Like, this movie has so many good moments. Like, the moment where the villain, sorry, the um, kind of shooter at the end goes, I'm vengeance, which is an echo of what Batman had said earlier. You're like, oh yeah, that's great that you get to show Batman what you're actually, what your message you're actually sending. And it's great that Batman has like a wake up call and he's like, oh shit. Uh, If that's what I'm putting out there, then I need to change my approach. Love that idea. I love the idea that you get Batman um, interfering with, selena kyle when she's just ready to kill the dude and he's like no that's not you don't want to be like him and then later on you get the exact same echo where he is just on the juice they literally show batman take steroids and (laughs) he's just like beating this man to death and she stops him and she's like no and it's like okay I, i i like this idea i like what we're getting i like calling out um the corruption um, in politicians and being like, hey, you think that it's one thing? No, everyone's in on it. This is like, that. that's just a PR stunt. I love the call out of being like, yeah, we got a new mayor, but nothing's really gonna change. I love the idea, as I had mentioned earlier, at this point in time, I'm just kind of doing like a recap of things that I really enjoyed, but I love the idea of Batman not knowing what a carpenter's tool is and <laughs> needing the assistance of someone who's actually working class to help him solve that realm of the puzzle. I love those things. I think those things are great. I don't think, I think each of those is a different theme and a different idea. And this movie just kind of felt like a hodgepodge of all those ideas instead of giving us one cohesive reading and interpretation. So for example, they do something that, uh, as much as Chris didn't like it, the 2000, what is it? I think it's 2021 movie or maybe it's 2020 movie. The Joker actually did really well, which is they were like, hey, by the way, Thomas Wayne, corrupt. And it's like, yeah. they committed to it. And this movie, they, they like five minutes doesn't go by between you learning that Thomas Wayne is corrupt and then them being like, or was he? I don't know. Can you trust a robber? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And like, sure. there's this idea of them wanting to give us, they really tried to challenge kind of like our D our, our idea of Batman, but they didn't commit. For example, one more example, and then I, I'll, I'll hand it back. The police. Now more than ever, police in mo- movies and media mean something. You want to know if the movie wants you to be pro-police or anti-police. We all have a very difficult complex feeling about the police and this idea that the police who are corrupt don't like this vigilante coming in makes sense why would you he's a disruption to the system but then at the at the peak of the movie when the mobster is being taken in you have all these cops who are like we're a good guy and it's like okay but isn't this the exact same department that we learned five minutes ago was filled with corruption so Unless you actually have a scene in that um, standoff or like that moment reveal where the mob is being taken in, where they actually turn around and then start handcuffing other cops in the department, then your message doesn't come across. All you're saying is you're still saying that it's literally just one guy. And once we get the one bad apple, then everything else is solved. Sure. And that's not the case. We know that's not the case. To, to your point, when he had that scene where uh, they escorted uh, Falcone out and um, he saw all the police and he was like, oh, I'll be out in the day. I thought they were going to say something like, hey, we're Metropolis PD. Like something to be like, oh we're not I the police that. that you bought out. Like we are people yeah. from the outside or something like that. Star City Police. Like give me a DC reference. I'm here for it. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, I, I share a lot of your same sentiment. I do feel like a lot of the family stuff kind of convoluted the story. There's so much that they don't commit to. Um, but I, I don't know, like to Chris Lord's point, if I'm listing my favorite Batman movies, it's probably closer to the top than the bottom. So here's the thing. And I feel like, I feel like 
the best of worst options doesn't mean it's good. Like, you know, like how yeah, I feel, yeah, I feel yeah. like this movie does a lot of things right. And as you said, it's visually very, very appealing. I think that like, if we were just going to go off of the set, the cast, the um, film, the score, if we were just going to go off of those things, then I think this movie is up there. But if we're yeah. talking story and plot, it falls short. Like, for example, let's talk about, I want to spend a little time talking about Selena Kyle because it, we would be like remiss not to do so. And then oh, I feel course, like, yeah. so. but Selena Kyle's character, Catwoman, is someone who, A, I feel like, again, they didn't really tease out her too much. It was just like, we see her and then the next five minutes, we see Batman following her. She's not stealthy at all. Like this is someone who is a cat burglar and there she doesn't like look around once to see if she's being watched. Like I would have loved, even if she would have looked like there's this scene where Batman is watching her. I would have loved if she just looked over and was like, oh yeah. Like you ever see those <laughs> um, videos of like YouTube videos or whatever of like cats in the dark and then it's like some infrared thing and the cat just looks in the camera and it's like, yeah. I see you. Like, I would have loved something like that where she's like, she's shown to be smarter and more um, onto it and experienced than this guy. So yeah. I would have loved yeah. if she was either equally as experienced as him or a little bit more experienced than him. But they really kind of diminished her power. And don't get me wrong, she's a great cat bug burglar and she's really one-on-one. -on -one. Zoe Kraffitz does an amazing job with what she's given, but also there's just so many leaps where it's like, oh, she just wants to fuck this guy for no real reason. Yeah. Doesn't really know who he is. She keeps being like, you're not like, like let's take down these billionaires. Um, sweetie, any cat burglar could see that that suit costs money. <laughs> you know, like, like you are wearing a knitted cap on your head. He's wearing water resistant um, play text. You know what I mean? It's like, this dude yeah. has money. And I would have loved her to either kind of like be aware of that and kind of call sure. him out a little bit and be like, let's take out these billionaires unless of course you happen to be one or something like that. And instead, we just get a, a cat woman, in my mind, who's very go with the flow. Like, she's feisty, but also she doesn't really push back in or challenge Batman in a way that I would have liked to see. Sure. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, you know, Siege, I, I, I feel like we talked about a lot. I have little nitpicky things, but I really don't have a whole lot more to add. I, I do want to know, you know, as we were talking, I was kind of like listing these Batman movies. Do you have, do you know what your list is as far as Batman goes? Um, I, I really, if we're including all the properties, I've said I haven't really watched um, the, I don't know the game version. I heard that this movie plays really well if you read the comic books and are familiar with the video games. Um, well, they, they actually released a prequel book for this movie that I read a summary on and actually had some really cool information in it, like that Batman was a boxer, that, yeah. he, built, that he was obsessed with uh, uh, fast cars and he built the Batmobile from scratch, that he was a scientist growing up and he excelled in science and he would take specimens and things that he found around Gotham and take them home to his lab and analyze them like a really cool interesting backstory that I was like oh some of that should, should have probably ended up in the movie to like was, for a three hour movie why didn't I get flesh out that? his character a little bit yeah <laughs> um but yeah you no know, I guess as far as just the, the the major motion picture releases uh live action do you have a, a top five or a top three Batman movies I would say, let's go. I, I'll say in no particular order because I, I would just need more time to kind of really ha ham this out. But 1989 Batman, uh, I feel like it does the Batman story great. It gives us the campiness, but it also gives us the grit and the dirt. Um, I feel like now in hindsight, Vicki Vale could be Harley Quinn and it would make that movie sure. like infinitely better. Um, and then I feel like we're going to go Dark Knight. Uh, it's a great, it's a great movie for what it is. Um, Heath Ledger does a great job for what he does. And I really do enjoy that. Um, Rogue, I'm going to say Joker. I think Joker is a wow. great, a great Batman movie in terms of it's a great movie with the Batman property. I think sure. Joker has actually done really well. I think Joker commits to the 
the world that it's in and the political commentary that it wants to make. I, sure. I find it very interesting that there was so much um, hubbub and worry about the Joker movie coming out and what what kind of repeat um, copycats we would get from that movie when this movie is actually one that's way more similar to real life where you have like a bunch of incels yeah. who follow someone on YouTube, uh, literally. <laughs> so um, that, that's gonna be my three. Then I will give you, um, I think Batman Returns is really good. Um, you know, getting Michelle Pfeiffer, iconic Christmas movie. Amazing. Um, Danny DeVito. Oh, like, hey, can I just point out, you pointed out that Batman Returns is a Christmas movie. I like that this was a Halloween movie. The yes. 2022 Batman is technically takes place between Halloween and Election Day. But yeah, they incorporate Halloween in it, which I always love Batman being around Halloween. I think that's cool. Well, but yeah, again, yeah. It makes sense. I think if we're going to talk about it, what makes more sense to premiere a movie about someone dressing up and going out in yeah. public? Halloween is the, per is, the, is the perfect time. Um, and then if we're going to round out, I feel like... Um, I want to do an animated one, but I'm just not confident on my animated ones. So I will give us Batman Begins. I also feel like that's a really good version of Batman. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, just just for the sake of time, I'll kind of breeze through my list because I have a top 10 and I'm going to start with the least and work <laughs> my way up. Yeah, go so, for it. Um, Snyderverse is where I'm going to start. Justice League, Batman v Superman, they're at the very bottom. Um, Batman, uh, I'm sorry, Dark Knight Rises, it's right there at number eight. I find that to be, in, in, there was just, there's so much I love about Batman Begins and Dark Knight that Batman, the Dark Knight Return uh, Rises, uh, such a stupid name. That movie just didn't do it for me. And so it ends up there. I also feel like that movie <laughs> suffered from, it had to pivot. Like that movie is one where, because of the death of Heath Ledger, they had to change their approach. And 100%. that movie I is just like weighted down by the idea of you, like you watch that movie and you're like, mm, but what could it have been had he still been here? You know, like, that's what I feel. I feel like you can't watch The Dark Knight Rises without being like, man, this movie is missing something. And it's very obvious who and what that is. 100%. <clears throat> it actually kind of makes more sense just to skip if you're going to watch ba Dark Knight Rises, just to watch Batman Begins and then Dark Knight Rises since Ra El's Ghoul is kind of the consistent throughout that. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> um, yeah, I agree. And so, okay, now, okay, we got through those. I actually, as we did this conversation, I realized the Batman is right there, like this 2022 one for me. And then it goes to Burton's The Batman, The Batman Returns. Batman and Robin is my number four. I know I'm going to wow. get that. Batman wow. Batman. You need to defend that choice. Because for me, the way I thought about these movies is which one would I be quicker to rewatch? Which okay. to me is the most rewatchable movie. And say what you want about those Showmaker movies. They're fucking fun to get drunk and like watch. Like they're so silly but and But are stupid. they good movies? I think no, no, no. <laughs> this has nothing to do with good. This has everything okay, to okay, do okay. with personal preference. Okay. And then my top three, Batman Begins. Batman Forever is my number two because I think it's the most fun Batman movie. And then Dark Knight, I just think is a perfect uh, movie throughout. So um, yeah, that, that's that I have goes to my say, top one. I feel like I said it earlier. I love this interpretation of the Riddler. We didn't spend a lot of time on the Riddler. Oh, sure, sure, I sure. I loved what we did. I felt like the Riddles were, like someone said, for those of you who don't know and don't have a history, the whole thing with the Riddler is he either gives you Riddler, he either gives you riddles to reveal a truth or he's giving you riddles that you don't know by solving, you're actually leading down a, a path that he wants you you know like his yeah. whole idea is like you by you solving these riddles you're actually assisting in his plan which this movie does right and i really enjoyed this interpretation of the riddler i felt like if we were going to get a live action one this is so dead on in the type of person riddler would be i just think that as you said in the third act we leave this kind of zodiac moment and instead we get a uh, dissatisfied public and again for me that kind of convolutes the message because 
these people, they're not saying that the quote unquote incels in this movie aren't fighting for women to notice them. They're not fighting yeah. for uh, white supremacy to come back in power. They're fighting corruption. And yeah, it's just yeah. like, or, or am I supposed to be against them? Yes, they're using violence to do so, but it's like, I kind of think that they have a yeah. point and, and they just want it to stop. And it would be so much better if we didn't have that like third leg, or as I said earlier, if we just use the orphans and now it's just like henchmen that we're dealing with sure, because sure. it doesn't put the the critical eye on the public and them fighting back. I feel like I actually, the public uh, fighting back is really, really important and needed. Totally. And you know, I, I kind of do like the, oh, we're going to flood Gotham. Like it's such like a, a classic Batman story for the Riddler to want to flood Gotham, bring all of the people in the one area and kill them. But like a bomb or something that would have been technical that he did, something that didn't involve other people since he was such a loner. Like I understand, like, I, I don't know. They were trying to bring in this kind of like Reddit incel culture thing into it as to how he built his following. But to your point, I just feel like it was unneeded. Um, but Again, the window was- also- destroying oh. the little bit of infrastructure that Gotham does have. I sure, think it's exactly. really yeah. funny that like the whole point of the Thomas Wayne build back better fund was to like help Gotham grow and every single turn we're just destroying more and more of Gotham. The 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 quote unquote heroes of the movie are constantly destroying the little bit of infrastructure that you have. And again to me as a Gotham knight Gothamite, I would think that, yeah, you would be pissed. The only way for me to get in and out of this city just was destroyed. I'm upset. My, yeah. Are my taxes paying for this? Because as of right now, all I see is a moody billionaire and a bunch of politicians and no one's helping me get to work on the day to day. I do have a guy who shows up randomly and then just beats thugs. I'm uh, sorry, not thugs. Yeah store robbers and children <laughs> like yeah, like yeah. those are that's the crime that batman's solving when in fact the riddler shows that there's so much higher white collar crime that he could be solving and again for me i would have loved that movie i would have loved I, for the riddler's plan to be like hey you're spending all this time looking at petty crime when there's an entire sure. elaborate crime ring going on in your front of your face. What are you doing about that? Like, that's what I want to see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I will say that Paul Dano's portrayal of Riddler was a standout to me. I did not care for the Joker post credit thing at the end. You know, I just felt like it just pushed it to a point where I was just like, I groaned. And like, I, I, I literally groaned because I was just, it, it started to me to start to get into the, like, suicide squad type of like oh we're just gonna throw shit out there now like it didn't feel like it added to the movie at all I mean even when I go back and watch Batman Begins you can argue that the entire movie is preparing Bruce to get that Joker card at the end of the movie like there there's a reason for the Joker to come up and just just feels like well we can't do a, a Batman story without at least mentioning the Joker having a cameo with the Joker when he has such a fantastic the best villains in all of comic book history like it's not all about this dude and i understand he's the art arch villain but gosh the the riddler's so smart in here he could have done this movie by himself and so that's that's my takeaway i'll just say uh two more two more really quick things one i was told uh, i think it was by lordy who was on earlier um that the matt reeves said that he was inspired by the 1966 batman and in that movie um you get the the bad the big bags are riddler catwoman and penguin and the joker and so he just wanted to get the joker in there to complete that and just mm. be like okay so i have a movie with all four of them because you you haven't gotten that and this is the first time that he had gotten like the other three all in in one so i thought that was really great and then uh and so it kind of made me understand but i do agree that like it feels like that. It feels like the Joker is tacked on at the end and it's not necessarily worth it. And then my question to you, and I really wish I had asked Lordy this, um, if you could add 
one villain to the sequels, like who would your choice be? Oh, it makes sense for villains in like, because I, I think you're right. We get the Joker and we get so many, but the Batman has such a good rogues gallery. So I would love to like hear hear who you would like to see next. That's the, you know what? That's a really good question. And I know that uh, Batman has like the most famous one. It's kind of hard for me to kind of pick one right now, but I would be really interested to see. Um, <laughs> is there a good way to do Mr. Freeze? Is yes. there a way to get it done? Like, yes. I, I would love to see a grounded, realistic Mr. Freeze. I don't know if that exists or not, but I just think that would be a, a cool way to go. And I know, like, like uh, I was reading up a little bit about, like, uh, Hush and some of the stuff uh, from the comic uh, uh, villains that I, I'm not super familiar with. And those all seem cool. I would love to be introduced to brand new villains that I haven't really gotten to experience. Like, to your point, like, we've seen Joker a bunch. We've seen two different Two-Faces. We've seen, you know, a, a Scarecrow. Like, we've seen two different Banes. It'd be nice to see someone new. Um, I'll say that my, my two are, uh, I would really love to see a clay face. I just like, I want to lie to clay face. I feel like that would be very interesting. And I don't know if like, it makes sense in this world, but I feel like a, a clay face is kind of menacing. And like the idea of someone kind of like phantom of the opera or just like, like this kind of like disfigured vendetta, you know, like, like, like old, to me, it feels very reminiscent of like um, what was I was thinking of Maltese Falcon and like all of those sure. older noirs. Like that's kind of like what what I get from Clayface, and I would really love to see. And then also um, the Ventriloquist. I feel like that's such ventriloquist. a ventriloquist, <laughs> but like like it seems very silly. But like also the Ventriloquist from the animated series is one of the more uh, dangerous uh mobsters out there so i feel like he he'd be great and then last but not least i'll say the mad hatter i feel like the mad hatter yeah. is who we haven't gotten and i'd be very interested to see what a live action mad hatter looks like absolutely absolutely <sighs> um okay well i guess you know that's pretty much it for all the things i wanted to cover i i just quickly want to ask a uh, favorite batman live action batman that uh, actor who's who's been batman keaton I'm a Keaton, Keaton boy. your favorite. All right, all right. Boy. You know what? Honestly, I'm Val Kilmer till the day I die, and I will stand you know what? I by can, it. I, 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 I can see Val Kilmer, but I feel like Val Kilmer is, to me, he's the Barbie version of Batman. Like, I like, and what I mean is, I literally see like an action figure version of Batman when I see yeah. Val Kilmer. Like, I don't take him seriously. I take him as a toy. <laughs> which, which, it, by the way, is exactly what they were going for. <laughs> and you know what? That's fine. I just, for me growing up, that was the VHS I had. And that was the Batman movie I've seen the most in my life. So whenever I think of Batman, Val Kilmer is the first person I think of. And I can't, I'll, I can't help that. And you know what? I don't want to help that, Mr. Kilmer. You did a fantastic job. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time. Thanks for joining us in this Extra Credit Report. Uh, give us your feedback. Let us know who oh, yeah. you would want to be in um, what villain you would want to be. Let us know what um, your top five Batman are and then who's your favorite live action Batman. Yeah, we'd love to know all these things. Um, guys, you can reach us at Bra Meets World Everything. Um, we have a report card episode that we're gonna be releasing soon. And I think we might even do more of these little movie mini episodes just because me and Siege both have the AMC theater pass. Um, so if you guys like this, let us know. If you guys have a movie coming up you guys want us to do a review for it, let us know and we'll, we'll squeeze out another extra credit for you. Absolutely. All right. And I guess that's it. All right, remember to dream. Try and do good. <laughs> I was trying to do a Batman voice. <laughs> Be vengeance. Yeah. Be vengeance. Be hope, I guess. <laughs> All right, later, bros. Later, bros.